Unredacted versions of Dr. Fauci's emails have been released. And what they show about COVID's origins could be explosive. Welcome to America Uncovered. I'm Chris Chappell. Is it just me, or has COVID-19 felt like a roller coaster? And we didn't even get a souvenir photo. What's that, Shelley? This episode is already demonetized? I didn't even say anything yet about the mysterious origin of SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. Okay, I see why this is demonetized. Last week, Republican members of the House of Representatives released more details from Dr. Anthony Fauci's infamous emails on COVID's origins. And it was yet another piece of a very complicated puzzle, or the worst game of Clue ever. Either way, it left a lot of people outraged. Except Hillary Clinton, whose excited Republicans are finally focusing on someone else's emails for a change. But before we get into those emails, let's take a look back at how we got here. Remember when everyone thought the coronavirus came from bats? Or possibly pangolins? That was approximately 16 years ago, in February of 2020. It feels like it's been 16 years. Back then, according to the media, the idea that the coronavirus might have come from the Wuhan Institute of Virology was an already debunked conspiracy theory. Conspiracies get debunked so fast these days. They barely even have a chance to bunk. Dr. Fauci repeatedly dismissed the Wuhan lab as the source of the coronavirus. And later on, the Biden administration reportedly shut down the Trump-era project pursuing the Wuhan lab leak theory. That was the story. But then, everything changed. The Wuhan lab leak theory suddenly became credible. So, does that mean it was undebunked? Rebunked? I'm going with rebunked. Fauci decided he was not convinced that COVID-19 developed naturally outside the Wuhan lab. Biden set up his own investigation into the virus origin as the lab leak theory became an object of debate rather than ridicule. And the Washington Post quietly modified their headline. If things keep going the way they're going, soon the Post is going to have to change the headline to this. Why was this rebunked? I'll tell you right after the break. Welcome back. So, a little over a year after the initial COVID outbreak in Wuhan, China, the narrative among politicians, bureaucrats, and the media regarding the lab leak hypothesis suddenly went from fringe conspiracy theory to credible and worthy of investigation. Kind of like hearing Snuggies are awesome. Seems ridiculous at first, but you can't dispute the facts. What changed to make the lab leak credible? Well, one thing that changed was public opinion. In April of 2020, a Pew poll showed that nearly 30% of the American public believed that SARS-CoV-2 originated from a lab in Wuhan, a theory that was almost certainly not true, according to CNN. By December of 2021, the Ronald Reagan Institute's 2021 National Defense Survey showed that more than 70% of Americans believed the lab leak hypothesis. There's only so much time politicians, bureaucrats, and the media can spend telling more than 70% of Americans they're wrong before it starts to backfire. Except when it comes to saying Marvel movies are overrated. Hey, you want to see the same exact superhero origin story for the 27th time? Why does everyone love them? Am I out of touch? No. No, it's the children who are wrong. One reason public opinion changed on the lab leak hypothesis was more information became available. Articles were published, some of them in science journals, others in the news, and Freedom of Information Act requests were made and fulfilled. There were a lot of those, including the one that led to BuzzFeed and the Washington Post getting a hold of Fauci's emails. You may have seen that BuzzFeed article, take this quiz to see which Fauci email you are. In addition to Freedom of Information Act requests, there were also document leaks. The evidence began to pile up in favor of the lab leak hypothesis, and began to look like U.S. tax dollars could have paid for research that ultimately led to a worldwide pandemic. Why don't tax dollars ever go towards anything we want, like free Snuggies? 
We did a whole episode on it for our other channel, China Uncensored, if you want to know more about the evidence for the lab leak hypothesis. Of course, of all the thousands of pages of documents that were dredged up by the FOIA requests, the ones that got the most attention were Dr. Fauci's emails, released last June. And we did an episode on that as well. We've been demonetized a lot. But the big problem with Fauci's emails and many of the other released documents was that they were heavily redacted. It looks like someone emailed the Black Flag logo. All those redactions left more unanswered questions than anything else. Which is why I said in our episode on Fauci's emails that this story wasn't over yet. Oh, how I hate being right all the time. So let's tell the next chapter of this never-ending story. Right after the break. Welcome back. Or not, it would seem that YouTube is still part of the fewer than 30% of Americans who believe the virus didn't come from a lab. I bet they also loved those overrated Marvel movies. On January 11th, Republican Congressman James Comer and Jim Jordan wrote a letter to Javier Becerra, the Secretary of Health and Human Services. In that letter, they included copies of previously redacted emails from Fauci, now unredacted. And what they found definitely makes Fauci and others in the National Institute of Health, like former director Francis Collins, look a little sus. Right-leaning media outlets reporting on the unredacted emails claimed that the emails show Fauci at best ignoring prominent scientists saying the virus looks like a lab leak, and at worst, actively covering it up. Meanwhile, prominent left-leaning media outlets reporting on the unredacted emails claimed Nothing. They simply didn't report on it. At all. Believe me, I looked. Couldn't even find a top 10 iconic unredacted Fauci clapbacks listicle on BuzzFeed. The major exception to this was The Intercept. But Fauci's unredacted emails contain quite a bombshell. A bombshell with a really long, slow fuse, so stay with me here. Fauci's original emails showed that on February 1st, 2020, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Francis Collins, who was then director of the National Institute of Health, and at least 11 other scientists attended a teleconference together. The conference call is not on record, but on February 2nd, the attendees continued their discussion over email, a discussion where each scientist weighed in on the origin of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Sadly, none of them confirmed my suspicion and said that Zoom was behind it. That's one conspiracy theory that still pre-bunked? But what several scientists did say was it looked like it could have come from a lab, like Mike Farzan, who discovered the receptor of the original SARS virus in 2005. In his notes on the teleconference, Farzan said he was bothered by the furin site. Farzan was talking about the coronavirus's furin cleavage site. Now, furin cleavage doesn't look like this, but sounds like it should. And that's how you get people interested in virology. The furin cleavage site is actually a place on the coronavirus's spike protein. Basically, it guarantees the virus will be very infectious to humans. Fun fact, this furin cleavage site doesn't exist on any other known bat coronaviruses. Fun fact number two, furin cleavage sites are often inserted into viruses as part of gain of function experiments to make them more infectious to humans. In fact, gain-of-function experiments with fur and cleavage sites has been conducted in the past by the head of coronavirus research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Hmm. So that's why Mike Farzan said he was bothered by the fur and site and says he has a hard time explaining how it got there if it wasn't in a lab. I also often wonder if doctors had something to do with adding fur and cleavage. So how could the fur and cleavage site have gotten there in a lab? Farzan argued that a likely explanation could be something as simple as passage SARS live coVs in tissue culture on human cell lines for an extended period of time, accidentally creating a virus that would be primed for rapid transmission between humans. You see, so simple. In short, he believed that the best explanation for SARS-CoV-2 was that it was a coronavirus that had been intentionally passed multiple times through human cells in a lab, 
which would result in a virus that was much more infectious to humans. This technique is called serial passage, or repeated passage. I haven't heard of viruses being passed around that often and irresponsibly since college. Andrew Rambout, a evolutionary biologist, also had some issues with the fur and cleavage site. He noted that the fur and cleavage site has resulted in an extremely fit virus in humans. We can also deduce that it is not optimal for transmission in bat species. Another scientist on the call was microbiologist and virologist Bob Gary. Gary's notes on the teleconference stated, I really can't think of a plausible natural scenario where you get from the bat virus, or one very similar to it, to NCoV. I just can't figure out how this gets accomplished in nature. Yeah, those definitely don't look natural. Hey, considering how often we get demonetized, we need to get the most bang for our buck on graphics. Evolutionary biologist Edward Holmes claimed to be 60-40 in favor of a lab origin. And director of the Wellcome Trust, Jeremy Farah, said he was 50-50. Days earlier, on January 31st, immunologist and microbiologist Christian Anderson had given his opinion. He was also at the teleconference, and he had written that some of the features of the virus potentially looked engineered, and that he, Edward Holmes, Robert Gary, and Michael Farzan found the genome inconsistent with expectations from evolutionary theory. Virologist Ron Fouché, meanwhile, argued that a non-natural origin of 2019 NCoV is highly unlikely at present. Any conspiracy theory can be approached with factual information. What we have here is innocent enough. A simple debate between experts over the origin of the virus, with several experts expressing doubts that the virus evolved naturally, and one expert expressing doubt that the virus came from a lab. Debates like these are exactly what makes science, well, science. I know, it's disappointing. Science is less Rick and Morty and more 12 angry men. The weird part is what comes next. Dr. Fouché went on to say that further debate about the origins of the virus would unnecessarily distract top researchers from their active duties and do unnecessary harm to science in general and science in China in particular. So debate, discussion, you know, all that academic sciencey stuff would do harm to science. Makes sense. That's like saying slapping a puck with a stick would do harm to hockey. Apparently, Ron Fouché made a forceful case. By the end of the conversation, Dr. Collins, the head of the NIH, said that he was coming around to the view that a natural origin is more likely, particularly due to Ron Fouché's arguments. And he agreed with Fouché about more than just that. Collins wrote that if experts didn't weigh in, the voices of conspiracy will quickly dominate, doing great potential harm to science and international harmony. Harm to science and international harmony? Strange, his opinion on the origin of the virus seems more political than scientific. Anyway, there were at least 13 scientists on the call. Eight expressed their views on the origin of the virus. Seven of them at least started out leaning towards a lab origin. Then, three days later on February 4th, four of those scientists co-authored a letter to the editor of Nature Medicine titled The Proximal Origins of SARS-CoV-2. Previously, all four authors had fallen on the side of a lab origin. By the time the final draft of the letter was published in mid-March, the authors argued that our analysis clearly shows that SARS-CoV-2 is not a laboratory construct or a purposefully manipulated virus. And by clearly show, they meant as clear as stained glass covered in yogurt. Greek churches are weird, man. This letter was widely used to debunk the lab leak hypothesis. Yet four out of the five authors had previously said in their emails they thought a lab origin was likely. What happened in between their email comments on February 2nd and the final publication of that letter on March 16th? Of course, people can change their mind. But if you suddenly saw a commercial that said four out of five dentists suddenly no longer recommend sugarless gum, you're going to have some questions. One thing that happened is that the authors of Proximal Origin sent the first draft to Dr. Fauci and Dr. Collins for review. And the feedback they got 
seems to suggest that something else happened somewhere in there, something we didn't see. Dr. Fauci responded to the draft letter with a sort of scientific WTF. He wrote, question mark, question mark, serial passage in ACE2 transgenic mice. It's hard to know exactly what that means, but it seems to be a reaction of disbelief that the paper includes any mention of lab manipulation, even just serial passage. Later, Dr. Collins responded that the paper was arguing against engineering, but repeated passage is still an option. It's hard to tell, is that a comment or a criticism? Kind of like when your mom says you would have done well in law school. <sighs> Whatever it was, it became apparent much later that Dr. Collins wanted more than he got out of the proximal origin letter. And what he wanted was for the lab leak hypothesis to be put to bed. The debunk bed. On April 16th, Collins wrote, wondering if there is something NIH can do to help put down this very destructive conspiracy with what seems to be growing momentum. I hoped the Nature Medicine article on the genomic sequence of SARS-CoV-2 would settle this, but possibly didn't get much visibility. Anything more we can do? So Collins is saying the proximal origin letter didn't work, so what else can they do? He cited this article as proof of the growing momentum of the conspiracy. Fauci responded with, I would not do anything about this right now. It is a shiny object that will go away in time. But the next day, Fauci cited the proximal origin letter as evidence against the lab leak hypothesis while speaking at the White House. You know, the letter that he and Collins reviewed and possibly edited? It now looks like Fauci and Collins were influencing the debate over COVID's origin from the very beginning. Not only is this bad because they were in positions of power to stifle scientific debate, it's also bad because if this was a lab leak, Fauci and Collins could be directly implicated in funding the kind of risky research that led to it. Clearly, there are still missing pieces to the puzzle. Even now, the story isn't over. It really is a never ending story. And what we have took a lot of work to get. House Republicans had to invoke an obscure law called the seven member rule to gain access to the redacted Fauci emails. And even then they were only allowed to see them in person with their own eyes, no phones, no cameras, no copies. They had to transcribe the emails by hand. Hopefully the Republicans have good handwriting. Typical reasons for redactions, such as taking out identifying information, don't seem to apply to the emails the congressman saw. So what is the justification for the redactions? And the stonewalling? And the restricted viewing? What more is there still to learn? Where will this roller coaster lead us next? Given how the ride has been so far, this is our face when they eventually take the souvenir photo. So what do you think about these new emails? Let us know in the comments. And since this episode is about the origins of the novel coronavirus, it's very likely that we will be demonetized, which happens often. So please go to our Patreon page, contribute a dollar or more per episode to help us continue to cover controversial topics in a nonpartisan way. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching America Uncovered.